I, I wonder, uh, you know, you talked a lot about the sort of the broad context in, in overarching uh, social and historical trends, uh, but I wonder if briefly you could talk about this as an intervention on the left uh, in terms of the kind of crisis that we on the left are currently uh, experiencing and, and what kind of, you know, what might Marx mean uh, for that? Well, the, the spectrum of politics, of course, is different in the U.S. from what it is in Europe. Mm -hmm. We have well-established uh, labor and social democratic parties, not most of them very successful just at the moment, but the oldest is the German Social Democratic Party, of course, which originally regarded itself as one of the legitimate heirs of Marx's ideas. Most of the left parties in Europe... Uh, since the decline of communist parties in the 1990s, adhere to one or another varieties of a mixed economy. So certain, uh, a certain range of public services, uh, provision of transportation, healthcare, and so on, either owned or at least managed by the public, and certainly subject to relatively strict state control, and of course, cost uh, management. And the, the crucial difference, of course, here between, just to take the most uh, single most important example, between Britain and the U.S. is that we have a free public health system. Mm -hmm. If you're ill, you go to the hospital, you go to your local GP. Uh, you're seen to. It's not a perfect system, but it's a very good one. And nobody goes bankrupt because of medical costs. Right. Uh, so this is regarded, I think, quite rightly by the Brits as... Uh, the chief inheritance of Labour's electoral victory in 1945. Now, of course, it's been picked away, and the current uh, Conservative government seems pretty clearly to want to privatize it uh, and to allow especially uh, North American private health companies to come in and essentially privatize the entire business. But there is tremendous loyalty on the part of the population, so privatizing the NHS is uh, not on the immediate cards. So, I mean, if you then think, however, of areas like transportation, uh, again, in the post-war period, most of, let's say, the railways in Europe and quite a lot of airlines were owned by the state following uh, the beginnings of the trend of neoliberal thought and legislation in the Reagan Thatcher era. Quite a lot of these have been privatized, but in some countries they are still in state ownership. And amongst the uh, aspects of the platform of the Labour Party at the moment is renationalization, for example, of the trains. Our uh, rail is sure. now the most expensive in Europe, uh, and it isn't terribly reliable, sadly, either. It's a very bad combination, poor, relatively poor service and extremely high prices. And in fact, renationalization is regarded as a very popular option amongst the electorate. So that's one of the things that uh, Jeremy Corbyn has proposed should he win the next general election. So the spectrum in that sense uh, is uh, rather further to the left than in the U.S. Now, if you go back to the beginning of the question you asked about the nature of left interventions, there is, of course, after 1991, quite a lot of uh, critical reaction to the idea of a left as such. Less so in Europe, again, than in the U.S. The taint, however, here of Stalinism and the whole of the communist experience is very, very powerful. And I mean, I, of course, uh, uh, I've had differences of opinion with lots of, of friends and colleagues on this particular issue. But it's been my view pretty much all the way through that the left has no interest whatsoever in trying to paper over the truth of what I think we can fairly call totalitarian regimes in the 20th century. Quite to the contrary, it's my view. I'm the last book I did just before Marx is called Dystopia and Natural History. And there's a long section in the center of that book where I look at Stalinism in various forms, but particularly uh, Eastern European and Soviet Stalinism. And I pretty much come to the conclusion that it's 
really awful system. I mean, number of victims under Stalin is probably up to 20 million. Uh, if you count various other regimes, Maoism and so on, it goes much higher than that. And dictatorships are particularly unpleasant, and these kinds of dictatorships are extremely unpleasant. Now, I think we have to just confront that. One of the questions, of course, you're led to ask, if you have an interest in the 19th century, and particularly in Marx, is, well, what's the accountability here? How far is Marx responsible for the degradation of Marxism into various forms of dictatorship, following in particular, of course, the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. That's a large and complicated question. I don't know if you want to pursue it now or uh, leave it to one side. But I, and the basic observation I'd make initially here is we have to ask these questions. We have to confront Stalin if we want to go back to Marx. It's that simple. We cannot simply jump over uh, the period from 1917 to 1991 and say, well, some mistakes were made and so on. But basically, Marx uh, you know, put forward a lot of really good ideas, which we should now return to. It's quite clear that if there's that much degradation, then we need to face up to the fact. And in fact, I don't think the left has a legitimate starting point anymore, unless it can put its hands up and say, mea culpa, we played some role in the production of this. If we're going to move forward with a critique of capitalism, which will appeal to a large part of the electorate, we have to recognize that some things went terribly wrong in the 20th century. And I think we can do that. That's not a problem. There are one of the reasons why the entry point that I've taken in the book uh, to Marx is, uh, as writing as a historian of socialism, is to Marx as a socialist, is that when Marx begins writing in 42, 43, 44, mm -hmm. he of course already witnesses, uh, so to speak, in the library on the table in front of him in the working men's clubs of the great cities, Cologne, Paris, Brussels, and so on that he lives in, he witnesses many different contending trends within socialism. They're not all communist, they're not all revolutionary. Some have different schemes of reward, which would reward effort differentially. Uh, others uh, disagree with that and emphasize the need for an equality of remuneration and so on. Uh, if we look at Robert Owen, if we look at Charles Fourier, if we look at Henri de Saint-Simon, some lesser known names amongst the Germans, Moses Hess, Wilhelm Weitling, and so on, Marx confronted along with the followers of all these uh, leading thinkers, Marx confronted an entire spectrum of socialist possibilities. Right. Well, that's the, in a sense, you know, in a sense, that's, you know, what I'm trying to get at. I mean, when we look at the imagination of a, of a Jeremy Corbyn, in some sense, you know, it's, it's looking backwards, you know, it's looking back to 45, uh, for instance. Um, and you know, really, the question is, you know, that 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 I think you know Marx poses is, can we look back at the history of revolutionary socialism, of uh, you know the actual, however we understand that, right? The the project of you know not you know not simply ameliorating capitalism, but transforming it into a new form of society. Um, and that obviously is a, you know, in other words, it raises the question of, you know, will capitalism once again generate, uh, you know, in a sense, there's a, there's a sense of the repetition of history. There is. Right? There is. And, um, and, and, you know, obviously we're never going to confront socialism the way that Marx confronted it, uh, as you're talking about. So that's what I was sort of getting at in terms of what a 21st century return to Marx could mean, since we've, it, it, it seems to me that every time this, the left experiences a crisis, there is the question of the return to Marx, um, whether it's the new left. Well, it would be a great shame, of course, if we hadn't learned anything from the 19th and the 20th century. I mean, historians simply throw their hands up in despair and <laughs> ask, well, you know, this would be a very sad kind of judgment on our capacity to improve gradually from our mistakes. Mm -hmm. We have to do that. But what that implies, as I think you're suggesting, is that if we're turning back to Marx in the 21st century, 
we want to be able to say what didn't work in the paradigm established in the 19th and moved forward in the 20th. Uh, so if, if we're going back, what we're trying to do at the same time is uh, to eliminate the possibility of at least making the same mistakes. Now, of course, the problems we're facing are not exactly the same for reasons I uh, kind of specified at the outset. The environmental issue is extremely different, extremely provocative. It forces us, I think, to go beyond both Marx and capitalism because we need to restrain the process of production. We need to restrain the process of consumption. We need also to restrain population growth because there just isn't enough of a planet to sustain. We now have slightly over seven and a half billion. We can't really even sustain that, much less the 10 to 15 billion we're projected to have by the end of the 21st century. So returning to Marx will mean plundering, picking and choosing, taking the bits that seem to work, but at the same time, then rejecting what doesn't seem to work. I think some of your listeners, at least, will probably be uncomfortable with the idea that Marx inevitably implies revolution. Now, the, the view I take of this is that, of course, by the 1880s, Marx had himself suggested that capitalism was amenable to peaceful transformation. He said this could probably only occur in the most advanced countries like Holland, Britain, and so on. But transformation through the ballot box is at least on the table by that point, by the time uh, Marx dies in 1883. So that we don't have to take the paradigm of 1917 as the only one that we can glean from Marx. Now the question then is, well, let's say that we agree peacefully to transform society and we want to put some new paradigm in place to uh, replace what we now call capitalism, though we haven't really defined exactly what that is yet. We need to think very carefully, of course, what that alternative is going to be. My sense is that there are a variety of halfway houses. These are the kinds of ideals contemplated by most of the left social democratic uh, socialist parties in Europe. So what this implies, first of all, is a mixed economy where there is both public and private ownership. What it implies is uh, control over uh, finance capital in particular. So, I mean, as uh, we're all well aware, there is a very substantial problem at the moment with uh, the wealthy and very large corporations being able to avoid tax so that the burden of tax is pushed ever further upon consumers and upon individual citizens. And something like 25% of the world's wealth uh, uh, is uh, outhouse located uh, uh, not transparently in tax havens. So we clearly need to move sharply against both of these phenomena. We need to make uh, large corporations responsible for taxes in the domains where they're making profits rather than being able by sleight of hand to, you know, one bit of the company lends another bit, uh, a large amount of money at a ridiculous sum of interest, that enabling it to cut its uh, supposed profits and so on. But it's really just mm -hmm. uh, that and the avoidance of tax and tax havens needs to be addressed immediately and again very sharply. We need maximum transparency, both of corporate taxation and of individual wealth accumulation. So then mixed ownership uh, within the economy as a whole, movement towards ever more sustainable economic goals. And by sustainable, of course, we mean uh, movement towards forms of energy production which don't uh, involve coal, increasingly also then not natural gas and so on, so wind and uh, electric first and foremost. And we then need to move to, uh, facing full on the potential for environmental catastrophe towards uh, producing goods which are uh, not guaranteed to break uh, within a short period of time, producing goods for the long run, in other words, without planned obsolescence. Uh, we need, as I suggested earlier as well, to start to think through the problem of overpopulation. All of these things, I think, can be solved. Uh, the crucial thing is we have to admit that the present system is broken. 
We have to admit that the existing system of inequality is extremely harmful. Uh, it's harmful not only because the poor are getting poorer and worse off as a consequence of the rich getting richer, but also, of course, it leads to the corruption of electoral processes almost everywhere. Mm -hmm. In a democracy, we essentially have plutocracy. A relatively small amount of, a uh, small number of people control such an amount of uh, propaganda that they have the capacity to swing electorates, as we know, in, uh, on many occasions. So I think, um, I don't imagine that this is a revolutionary scenario. I mean, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I do think that there is coming now the sense that, uh, which is just beginning to gel, especially amongst uh, the younger generation, the sense that the system is broken, the sense that probably it's been broken from the beginning, but that uh, now because of this new factor, the environmental crisis, we have to address fully the implications of staying on the path that we're on at the moment. And those implications are catastrophic. So once we face up to that, then we can set out, I think, a rational course. Thanks for that. I'm, I want to talk now about, um, you know, as a historian, I want us to talk about Marx and the 19th century. Uh, one of the things that I was most excited about with your book is that you are a historian of socialism. Um, and that really gets to this question that I want to ask about, which is the environment of Marx's coming of age in the 1840s. Uh, that was the time that, that Marx was becoming the Marx that we know, uh, the Marx of history. And for him, there were, of course, there was, as we all know, you know, it, it's French socialism and English political economy and German philosophy that are, in some sense, the streams that feed into Marx. Uh, but it was really in that period, uh, the legacy of the French Revolution and, and, and socialism and the philosophical aftermath of Hegel. Uh, and so I'm wondering how we can think about those two things together in the way that they were um, you know, comparable for Marx, that those two streams were uh, flowing, uh, you know, together in the Young Hegelians and, of course, in socialism. So who and what were Marx's key influences and points of reference in the period of 1842, 3 to 47? And in what ways did those influences abide for Marx? In what ways did he remain uh, the socialist that uh, that he became in 1843, and in what ways did he remain a young Hegelian his whole life, and in what ways was he a critic of socialism and of philosophy? So we we first encounter Marx as a serious thinker in 1842, and at this point he is a radical of a type which is immediately recognizable in that environment given the inheritance of the French Revolution of 1789. So to be a radical in this, although there are a number of different positions covered by that term, implies, uh, first of all, the pursuit of universal, at least manhood suffrage. Some people are plumping for female suffrage as well, but not very many in this period. So universal suffrage is the most important thing. Secondly, then, uh, the establishment, generally speaking, again, some disagreements, of a democratic republic. Uh, that's the idea which is, again, inherited from uh, 1789. So the abolition of the monarchy, the abolition of aristocratic privilege, and uh, the holding of large uh, portions of land by churches and so on. That's Marx's starting point in 1842 when he becomes a journalist. Now, the trajectory of development over the next two years is quite dramatic and extremely intense. Uh, Marx is already a very intense person to start with, but he's thinking in a kind of burning the midnight oil constantly in an environment where it seems at this point that revolution may well be on the cards in any number of different European countries in the uh, near to short term future. Mm -hmm. So around 1843, we still find Marx uh, disavowing any kind of communism. So he remains a radical through at least 1843. 
The point of conversion is 1843 into 1844. And there are a number of different influences here, of course, from the young Hegelian circle, particularly at Berlin, men whose names are pretty well unknown today, Edward Ganz, Bruno Bauer, uh, the communist Moses Hess, uh, Ludwig Feuerbach, who is extremely important for Marx through 1845. And the point of conversion is a point at which, in part, uh, Marx uh, finds himself pushed onto a completely different tra trajectory through meeting the man who would, of course, become his lifelong intellectual partner, Friedrich Engels. And they had met very briefly once beforehand, but when they first meet in August of 1844 uh, at the Café de la Régence in Paris, they get on like a house on fire. Now, mm -hmm. in an important way because Engels, who works in... Uh, as a lowly clerk, uh, uh, really just uh, playing a minor supervisory role at a cotton spinning factory in Manchester, which is partly owned by his father. Engels, when he headed off to Britain to take up this job in the autumn of 1842, had become a communist as a result of a conversation with one of the few leading communists in Germany at that point, a man named Moses Hess. When Engels then lands in Manchester, so he's a brand newly minted uh, communist, he finds that there is a fairly well-organized group of the followers of the founder of English socialism, a man named Robert Owen. Right. He's a Welshman to start with, but then runs a very successful factory at a place called New Lanark, which he becomes manager of in 1800. And for some strange reason, by about 1815, uh, 1817, Owen decides that although he's making a vast amount of money, becomes a very wealthy man, he doesn't like the capitalist system. He doesn't like what it does to workers. He doesn't like the narrow division of labor. He doesn't like the conditions of work, which are hot, unhealthy. He doesn't like the fact that young children are widely being employed from the ages of six or even seven. They are useful for crawling under the machinery and repairing broken threads. They suffer large numbers of injuries as a consequence of the fact that the machinery is not uh, wholly enclosed. Uh, they suffer from curvature of the spine as a result of bending over for 12, sometimes even 15 hours a day. So Owen turns against this, and in the 20 years then up to the time that Engels meets with uh, the local group of Onites in Manchester, he founds the first major socialist school in Europe. So by the uh, time that Engels then uh, attends uh, every Sunday, as far as we know, the local, they're called Halls of Science, uh, the local Onite meeting ground, uh -huh. Owenism has become identified with a theory of capitalist crisis with a critique of political economy as a way of understanding those crises and the nature of capitalism, and as proffering an alternative, which is uh, atheistical and communistical. Now, Marx has uh, converted to atheism already, but communism now is reinforced through this meeting with Engels. So the crucial point is then really the, the time that Marx spends in Paris, uh, in 1844, which brings about his writing of the so-called famous Paris manuscripts, or economic and philosophical manuscripts. Not published in Marx's lifetime, not published indeed until 19... And that's, those, those manuscripts are written around the time that he's um, becoming friends with Engels, or...? It's... That's right, in that very summer, as far as we know. Uh-huh. So, I mean, there is a problem hanging over the text, insofar as for most later modern readers, that's to say after about 1960 or so, the Paris manuscripts are the entry point into the whole of Marx's thought. And Marx has here portrayed the famous theory of alienation of the worker, the alienation of the worker from themselves, from other workers, from uh, the object or product of labor, and from uh, the terms taken from uh, Feuerbach, species being from our sociable essence. This theory uh, beautifully evokes an image of Marx as a kind of humanist, 
And for this reason, when the text was first published, many existing communist regimes were extremely suspicious about it. It appeared to indicate that actually existing socialist or communist societies, in fact, uh, rendered the workers just as alienated as they were under capitalism. Heaven forbid, of course, they didn't want to draw that conclusion. So there was a maximum effort to suppress this text. But by the late 1960s in particular, this was the entry point for almost all readers of Marx now. And this is the point where, again, if you're first encountering Marx when you're 18, 19, 20, 21, this is a really exciting text. It appears to offer a kind of existential view of humanity's plight in general, namely that we are alienated as we enter the world. It appears to identify the productive process as the crucial site which generates this alienation. But it also kind of hints at the fact that there are other forms of alienation and that there is underlying all of this still the possibility of developing a higher form of humanity. Now, this, I think, is uh, the legacy which Marx takes to the later writings. There has been a lot of controversy, of course, about the degree to which Marx uh, changes his mind uh, from this point onward, because he doesn't publish the text, and because, in particular, the text seemingly centers upon Feuerbach's idea of species being, which is kind of theory which we might uh, paraphrase today by saying it's an account of a kind of innate sociability that we possess. We naturally want to live communally with other human beings. We naturally live on good terms with them. What interferes in modern society with our ability to develop those closer, warm communal relations is the fact that the economic system makes us all competitors. It pits us ruthlessly, mercilessly against one another and makes it impossible for us really to offer the kind of mutual assistance that the concept of species being hints is the essence of what it is to be a human being. So Marx takes this as his critical standpoint in 1844. More than anything else, he says, what's wrong with capitalism is it doesn't allow us to fulfill the potential of our humanity. It doesn't allow us to fulfill the creative uh, possibility of uh, development uh, through the division of labor in particular, because it's Adam Smith's famous account in The Wealth of Nations that is the starting point in the Paris manuscripts. Through the division of labor, we become more and more narrow and specialized less and less capable of developing fully and richly all of those creative capacities. I wonder, uh, Dr. Clays, if you can tie that to what Engels is bringing from the Owenites in terms of their thinking about cooperation and the kind of influence that has on Marx really over a long period. Engels' contribution at this point is complex and extremely interesting, I think. When he meets Marx, of course, he has much more practical experience of what the factory system is. And of course, in 1845, the next year, he'll go on uh, to publish The Condition of the Working Class in England, 1844, still one of the greatest accounts of the life of the urban working classes in the Industrial Revolution. But Engels is also much more attracted to the small-scale kinds of communities that many of the early socialists proposed. This is not just Owen and the Owenites, it's also Fourier and his followers, the Fourierists, both of whom would recommend that the optimum model of association of human beings is a small-scale community, maybe a thousand, maybe 1,500 people, sharing property in common, by and large, on the Owenite side, Fourier had a slightly different scheme in mind, but able, and this I think is the crucial point, able by virtue of living on a small scale to regulate the communal relations of this group of a thousand or perhaps at most two thousand, by virtue of everybody knowing what everybody else is doing all the time. So you could trace this kind of description all the way back to Thomas More's Utopia of 1516. The idea that uh, the, the optimal form of community will include a kind of mutual surveillance. It sounds a bit sinister today, but it's not really uh, envisioned that way, of course, by these writers, whereby people will not have the opportunity really 
to break the most fundamental rules of the community because everybody's living under the eyes of everybody else. So Engels finds this superficially quite attractive. He studies some of the uh, communal examples. A number of them are North American, the Shakers, and so on. Uh, and he's quite enthusiastic about the Owenites as well. The problem comes in that the great Owenite final effort to create just such a community into which a vast amount of money is poured fails at exactly this moment in 1844-1845. And with it seemingly goes out the window the entire possibility of socialism being realizable in terms of a small-scale community. So between 1845 then and 1848, the manifesto in particular, mm -hmm. uh, Marx and Engels clearly we have some indications from correspondence and so on from, about their discussions in this regard. But Marx and Engels are clearly trying to sidestep the possibility that the failure of communitarian Owenism means the failure of socialism as such. By 1847-1848, they move to the view that if socialism is now to be realized, it will likely be revolutionary, first of all, that's what the manifesto proclaims, and secondly, it will take place at the level of the nation state rather than the small-scale community. So Engels later on in life still hazards a few complimentary remarks about Owen Fourier and company, about overcoming a division of labor between intellectual manual labor between countryside and cities and so on. This is much more pervasively taken up by uh, some other later socialists, William Morris most notably. But by and large, Marxism after 1845 is oriented towards a mostly revolutionary model, mostly focused on the nation state. So having said that, uh, however, to, if we go back to 1844, mm -hmm. of course, if Marx's critical standpoint is Feuerbach's conception of species being. So he's saying what's wrong with capitalism is it doesn't allow us to develop this natural communal essence that we all possess. He drops the concept of species being after 1845. And this has caused a lot of alarm amongst Marxist scholars. Because, and this may have been the reason why he never publishes the 1844 manuscript. In which case, why are we paying so much attention today? can we still legitimately regard it as the entry point into Marxist system as a whole? That's a crucial question, I think. What happens is that Feuerbach's concept is demolished by another young Hegelian named Max Stirner, who is an anarchist, an egotistical uh, anarchist, who says, oh, species being is just theology, basically. It's just wishful thinking. It's the last stage of the Hegelian system. And we don't want anything to do with such theological concepts. So what Sterner basically is saying is, this is just an imaginary form of community which Feuerbach has made up. And it's no different from, Feuerbach, of course, is famous for describing religion as a, uh, a projection of an imaginary ideal community. Right. We think of heaven, we think of everybody you know, getting along well and singing hymns and so on. It's all very amicable and all very sociable. But what is this other than, uh, Stirner is suggesting, a projection of our desire to have such harmony in this life? And because we can't have it, then we think that the afterlife will provide precisely that measure of harmony, sociability, and justice, which we're not getting in this life. So it's a thorough, thorough demolition of all such religiously based uh, theologically derived social concepts. So what is Marx then left with if he rejects what is the central concept of the Paris manuscript species being, what does he have? Well, the answer uh, to this that's usually now agreed, although there's plenty of controversy here as well, is that in the German ideology, the text which he and Engels uh, sit down and write over the winter of 1845-46 in Brussels. Marx says, okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to proclaim an entirely new system. We're going to call it the materialist conception of history. We're going to set aside all preceding forms of ideology, morality, religion, metaphysics, all existing forms of socialism, communism, and so on. We're going to proclaim an entirely new system and 
here comes vis-a-vis species being the crucial point, we want the morality of the new society, uh, we, we believe it will, uh, emerge out of existing social relations. So to go back to your question of cooperation, right. this now becomes absolutely central to Marxist vision of the future. So that rather than saying what's wrong with capitalism uh, is the failure of capitalism to be able to allow us to realize our species being, Marx now says there exists out there a communist movement. This movement is growing within capitalism, so we're describing only an empirical process. We're not using a normative, moralistic precept or judgment, much less a theologically derived precept, to judge capitalism. All that we're doing is describing a process that now exists. And Marx then says, and he will adhere to this view the rest of his life. What the materialist conception of history consists of is an analysis of a series of modes of production, of which the latest and vastly the most important is the capitalist mode of production. In the course of the development of capitalism, very large numbers of workers are driven from the countryside into the factories in the new cities. This is the face of modernity. In the process of engaging with one another in very large numbers in the cities, they become conscious of the deficiencies of capitalism and conscious of their own homogeneous role as a class, as a proletariat. Once they become conscious, then they gain a sense of cooperative uh, enterprise or solidarity, which grows out of the very process of work itself. So it's not a norm, Marx insists. Right. Uh, it's not a norm being imposed from without. It's something which emerges from the very process of capitalism itself. Now, I try to adjudicate, as uh, in my book, it's very difficult. You know, the Marx section is only 60,000 words, uh, which mm. is a very short essay, really, on a very large subject. And then the Marxism is about the same length. Mm. Uh, a very large, complicated subject, not a lot of space, which is why I haven't said uh, much about certain things which a longer book would have been able to address. But one of the things I have tried to do in the book here is to adjudicate as to just how seriously we should take Marx's claim now, that there is no existing moral perspective, and that there he has uh, legitimately, completely ditched the concept of species being. So what I try to do, and Marxists no, will no doubt uh, take me to task for this, is I try in the first instance to well, describe Marx as utopian. It, it, yeah, I was, I, was, I was going to say that, uh, you know, you really set this up in the book in a very provocative way uh, by, in a sense, counterposing, uh, you know, what you might call a... a, a a Hegelian attempt to simply be the mouthpiece uh, for society's own tension and ultimately its contradiction versus what you, as I say, provocatively call Marx's utopianism. Um, well, I, of course, don't mean the word utopian in a negative or pejorative sense at all. I think utopianism is basically about being able to project into a fairly distant future trends in a given society, and then asking the basic question, is this the road we want to take, or are these roads in combination the way we want to move forward? And if not, if they're somehow failing, for example, to allow us to develop our human potential, what can we do about it? So I think that's a really good general question to ask in every epoch. And I think Marx asks it repeatedly. Now, what links him, the other reason I call him both a utopian and an idealist, and Marxists, of course, don't generally like either of these labels being pinned on Marx, is that there is very clearly a set of ideals which is present from 1844 onwards right down through the end of Marx's life. Marx adheres to the idea of all-rounded development centrally. That's his, his most important critique of capitalism is doesn't respect inequality, but respects the operations of the division of labor. This is the starting point of Owen as well, but it's, of course, the starting point in uh, Chapter 1, Book 1 of The Wealth of Nations of Adam Smith. And Smith, by the end of The Wealth of Nations in Book 5, says, oh, well, I do realize 
just having a kind of conversation here with his friend Adam Ferguson. I do realize that if you make, uh, he uses the example of making pins, if you make somebody do nothing all day long but to cut a bit of wire in order to make pins, they're going to become as stupid as it is possible for a human being to become. I'm paraphrasing. Right. Here. And he says essentially, people are becoming appendages of machines. And this, I think, is one of the great themes of the whole period from the Wealth of Nations right up to the present day. We're asking people to become more and more like machines because machines become our model of efficiency. The problem is, this degrades our humanity. So if we look carefully then at the relevant passages, in particular in Capital, the Marxists usually accorded the status of Marx's most important work. So Capital is published in 1867, the first volume. We find exactly the same comments about mutilation, uh, narrowing down uh, the, and fragmenting the possibility of human beings uh, developing their full creative personalities that we find in 1844. So this is Marx's ideal. The ideal pre-exists the critique of capitalism, and it's right there through the end of Marx's life. And I don't have any problems with both diagnosing this as an ideal, as a utopian ideal, and commending it at the same time. I think it's a very humane approach to the problem of being a human being. Uh, we are not very good at imitating machines. It does degrade us. It does mutilate us. It does render us vastly less than we're capable of becoming. In that respect, Marx remains absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And you, this really turns on the issue of both the alienation, if you will, of, the, of human sociability uh, in production. Uh, in other words, the way that social cooperation uh, is turned against human beings uh, in production, as well as the whole question of unemployment versus free time. Uh, in in capital. There's no doubt that one of the shifts in emphasis that occurs in Marx's later writing is towards the notion that rather than focusing on the process of production itself, as Marx does in the Paris Manuscripts of 1844, we ought to think about enabling the workers, so designing a society where the workers possess the capability by having much more free time to educate themselves. So the shift is away from alienation in production to the notion that free time is where the full creative development of the personality is going to take place. With this comes a certain maybe reluctance uh, to acknowledge that socially necessary labor, that's to say producing the commodities that everybody needs, will remain in at least the uh, near and interim future, before machines do virtually all of this. People will still be working at mundane, boring uh, jobs which make them unhappy. The crucial point, until such time as machines can do this, is to minimize the amount of time they have to spend doing this. But both Marx and Engels later on do say, well, you know, it's kind of in the nature of the factory system for an authoritarian system of production to be imposed on the workers, because that's the only way you're going to maximize production. Mm -hmm. So that is the shift, but I don't think it's uh, that dramatic, actually. I want to. Uh, I want to ask. Uh, we're running over time a little bit, and and we'll manage this in in editing. Um, I want to ask you. We've talked. To, I want to ask you two further questions. One is we've talked about. One is about the inheritance that Marx and Engels have and reshape. We've talked about uh, the young Hegelians. We've talked about uh, Moses Hess. We've talked about Robert Owen. Uh, but I wanted you to, um, to speak about two, what seemed to me like relatively neglected questions in the book. Uh, and then I wanted to ask you a question about, about 1848, and we can conclude with that. Uh, the figures that I, I feel like uh, you perhaps downplay uh, in relation to other uh, scholars are, one, the Chartists, 
uh, in their influence, and the other is Proudhon. In, in here I'm talking about in, in the same period that we've been concentrating on uh, for in the mid to, to late 40s. Yeah, I think in both cases, really, it's not that I don't think these influences are present. And I've written a bit on Chartism. I've never written on Proudhon, but of course, he is uh, through his the philosophy of poverty, which Marx responds to in the poverty of philosophy. He is one of Marx's main contenders right through this period into the period of the first international. Now, the, the Chartists, I think, are as such less important for both Marx and Engels than the Owenites are, by quite a long shot. So my gamble in the book was, I uh, have a very limited amount of space, it's probably better to explore Owenism more. Most of the Chartists were not socialists, most of them were not revolutionaries. The Chartists that Marx and Engels become best acquainted with uh, are uh, George... Uh, uh, Harney. Owens. Uh, both owe quite a bit to socialism, but they are the exception rather than the rule. So, I mean, again, my, my feeble excuse here really is that I had to leave an awful lot on the cutting room floor in uh, this section, and I just couldn't detail all of the possible influences. Mm -hmm. So, the question of 1848 then. Of course, the revolutions which occur in 1848 uh, succeed revolutions which have occurred previously in 1830 in France, but most importantly, of course, in 1789 in France. The difference between the 1848 revolutions, which take place throughout uh, Europe, North and South, East and West, but not in Britain, of course, is that for the first time, a socialistic alternative is genuinely presented as one of the possibilities which might follow the revolutionary overthrow of the old system. Up to this point, the real alternatives, as I uh, indicated at the very beginning of, of our uh, talk this afternoon, uh, the alternatives were essentially a, a democratic republic as opposed to the existing systems of monarchy and aristocracy found in differing forms throughout Europe. So what 1848 does, first of all, and Marx summarizes this uh, very elegantly in the Communist Manifesto of 1848, which is the starting point, I think, for most students uh, today. Those who don't take the Paris manuscripts as their starting point. We'll begin here because here we have a programmatic statement of exactly what Marx anticipates. So this is a kind of summary of the whole accounting of the early schools of socialism, of Engels' confrontation with political economy, and Marx's acknowledgement that this has got to be the way forwards. Uh, now an account which uh, details how a uh, sequ sequential process of capitalist crises will bring about the ever greater concentration of wealth in the hands of the few. Each crisis will lead to more and more small-scale producers being pushed down into the proletariat. Each crisis then will lead to the rich becoming richer, again, to go back to the 2008 uh, discussion we had a while back. And when the proletariat becomes conscious that this is the natural development, the rhythm of, of capitalism itself, it will now, having acquired through solidarity and through uh, the process of cooperation uh, and joined uh, and forced upon it in uh, capitalism, it will now see that its uh, goal and its aim, its purpose, if you like, in uh, history is to overthrow this system and replace it with firstly the dictatorship of the proletariat as Marx called it just a few times and then eventually of course the realization of communist society so 1848 is central for a lot of reasons it uh, summarizes in the manifesto almost all the key developments from 1842-43 onwards it determines that all the pre-existing forms of socialism and communism are inadequate it designates under the rubric of uh, the materials conception of history what the analysis of capitalism will look like and why uh, the new agenda of uh, common ownership, centralization of uh, the means of production under the management of the state and so on will take the place of the existing system. So that's the model 
essentially defined in 1848 that will be followed by most in the Marxist tradition, not all, of course, but most, right through the end of the 20th century. But, the, I mean, it seems to me that the experience that Marx has is that in some ways, um, you know, democracy becomes a problem in 1848. Uh, of course, Louis Bonaparte is a vindicator of universal suffrage, um, you know, stages his coup in the name of it, and, yeah. and, and, and is elected on that basis. And so the whole question of, of you know, the, the Cossack Republic issuing into a kind of, um, you know, Bonapartist democracy, um, you know, seems to me a, a, a political legacy of Marx's thinking that you would, you would, you know, you did allude to with, you know, reference to the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Mm -hmm. Well, Marx is, of course, deeply disappointed with the outcome of 1848, but he's in it for the long run. Uh-huh. Of course. Of course. I mean, I think the, the crucial question that most people would ask at this point is, isn't the dictatorship of the proletariat designed to centralize power in the hands of the leaders of a communist party? So if we kind of Leninize Marx here, isn't this version of Bolshevism in 1917 anticipated or preceded by this kind of discussion on Marx's part? And the answer to this is, by and large, it isn't. Marx remains a quite traditional democrat, right through the writings, certainly, of the Paris Commune. Now, of course, he never has to face a revolution, so he never has to face the crucial questions of what if there are splits amongst the communists themselves? What if they take two, three, four different routes into the future? What if they uh, assume different factions and so on? What if leaders arise? Marx says very little about the role of leadership as such. Uh, could it be possible that a small faction could rule dictatorially over the party and the party could rule dictatorially over the whole society? Could it then be possible, a la Lenin, for an individual to become a dictator within the party? And the answer to this, by and large, right through the writings of the Paris Commune of 1871, is Marx remains absolutely a traditional democrat. Marx's view of the interim form of society is that the workers elect their own leaders by universal suffrage. They, those leaders are subject to recall pretty much instantaneously, and they are crucially paid no more than a worker's wage. Mm -hmm. This eliminates the ability of a professional political class. This eliminates, now we begin to wonder how uh, really uh, over-optimistic Marx was in this regard. This implies the elimination in turn of a professional class of bureaucrats, even though we know that the centralization and the management of production in the hands of a few managers implies an extraordinarily sophisticated and complex mechanism being uh, in place in order to do this. More bureaucratic indeed by and large than most capitalist societies. But as far as the democratic aspect is concerned, Marx, the phrase dictatorship of the proletariat is very misleading. Marx is really quite a traditional Democrat. Dr. Clays, I want to thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. This has been... A My pleasure. So I hope reaction to the program is good. Absolutely. And I will get back to you and I'll send you a copy of the you know, edited and broadcast version. Um, okay, that's great. So, so we'll be in touch uh, via email. Thank you so much. That's great. 